Okay, good morning. And start, and we'll start with questions from prior classes, primarily metabolism, but of course about anything. And uh, our special questioners are Jonathan Vo, Amber, and Eden, if you want to ask anything. But of course, anybody can ask a question. So. Yeah, hi. Um, I could start us off. Um, I did have a sleep question, but I don't want to put anybody on the spot. Maybe it's just a general discussion question, if that's okay. Any way you want. Okay. Um, I, I wanted to, well, I really enjoyed the presentation yesterday, and I think I kind of got this question in my head after Brian's presentation. Um, I wanted to ask a question about uh, ecological trade-offs of sleep. Um, basically, I started reading a little bit more about the topic, and I was just wondering, like, what would happen to, like, what trade-offs would exist for a bird that's migrating? Um, like, I, I found a study that said um, some birds migrate nonstop for days, and that they can kind of, like, power nap. Um, not exactly power nap, but they uh, can like close one eye and get sleep for a couple seconds while they do that. Um, but it said overall they'll only end up doing the power nap for like one hour a day. But when they land, they'll sleep for like 12 hours a day. Um, so I don't know. It was just really interesting to me. And I was just thinking like um, the paper also argued that like humans tend to sleep uh, less or poor, poorly when they're in like a new environment. And so I was just thinking, can we, can we use animals to better understand human sleep? And, um, I don't know, it's just kind of like open-ended thoughts about that. It was pretty cool to see though. Brian, you're on the spot. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't really know. Like, you, you don't have to, you know, it's okay. Yeah. Sometimes, just... sometimes, um, Questions are statements rather than questions, so you can answer any way you want. <laughs> yeah, or like a statement. <laughs> yeah, I guess you're talking about the unidirectional, or not, was it the unihemispheric sleep? And yeah. it seems like maybe that's not as functionally beneficial as regular sleep, to where you can turn off both parts of your brain, because maybe both of them need to be off for some functional thing. But um, turning one of them off at a time allows sort of like resting, but you can also maintain um, temperature and that kind of stuff. So I don't know, actually, like, all the sort of ecological trade-offs that would result in these migrating birds developing that, and also, like, um, the convergent evolution of it in the um, aquatic mammals, they also do it. So I don't really know what the trade-offs are. I didn't read that much about it, but it's pretty interesting. Yeah, it's definitely interesting. Thank you. Okay. This is interesting, actually. When you were asking that question, I was thinking, um, you know, one of the suggested functions of sleep is consolidation of memory and learning. And yet, if the birds really seem to need a major catch up when they land, it's not that obvious that during migration, when you're flying all day, that you would necessarily need to catch up on um, something that you learned a couple days ago that you didn't have a chance to sleep on. Um, but we also know that sleep has multiple functions, so it isn't that that um, argues against the role of sleep for consolidation of learning and memory, but really argues that there are multiple functions. Um, yeah, because one of those functions was like clearing the um, waste products from the brain, exactly. so maybe that's just helping with that, because those are building up over time, but there's not enough time to like take a nap and actually clear them, so you can clear half at a time. Yeah. Yeah, you can imagine that flying all day, you really build up some stuff in the brain. Um, but, you know, that's definitely interesting. And it's always good to bring ecological questions in because a lot of, it, you know, one of the funny things about modern biology is that there's a lot of discussion of function, but so little discussion of what the organisms actually do outside of the laboratory often. So I think that's a particularly good question, yeah. Okay, others? There was uh, something that kind of came to mind. Um, I think when we 
very first started talking about metabolism, uh, somebody brought up the idea of cross feeding, where um, these like bacteria are sharing nutrients essentially with each other. Mm-hmm. And I was just wondering, um, is the occurrence of overflow metabolism going to change based upon if cross feeding is happening? Um, Well, there's a lot of things associated with that question. One of the really interesting things that I find is that, for example, if the concentration of, of a product that's being overflowed, like ethanol or acetate, starts to build up, especially acetate, you can get a reversal and the organisms start to take up acetate rather than release it because everything's concentration dependent. If you have a lot of products of a reaction, that tends to push the reaction in the opposite direction. The same thing's true with excretion of metabolites. If you have a very large concentration of a product that's sort of like a waste product and it starts to build up externally, the natural gradient is to come back into the cell. And so one of the functions of multi-species communities is sometimes to have a second organism take up the excreted product of a first organism just to keep the first organism's ability to keep things flowing, so to speak, if you understand what I'm saying. And so, and I like that example because it really focuses your attention or one's attention on thinking about concentration and flow and the need to relieve product in order to keep everything moving. And this is something that you don't see with those, as I emphasized when I talked about metabolism, you see those static pictures of metabolism with every step, you know, coming down in free energy or up in entropy. And so you get the idea, okay, well, every reaction just naturally goes because the next reaction is to something that's at a lower free energy state is the typical way to say it. But that's all concentration dependent. And so one aspect of of multi-species interactions is to keep that distributed metabolism flowing. Um, That's just one example. Another possibility is, you know, the question is whether, the the key question in cross-feeding is whether an organism is excreting a product in part because it gains a functional benefit by helping another species, which in return, that other species then returns some other benefit, as opposed to just dumping some stuff that's waste for the first species, and it just so happens that another species can use it. Both both happen, but obviously when you're trying to study this, um, the difficulty of inference, of, of, of obtaining evidence for the functional excretion of a product in order to gain a return benefit is much harder. It's much more challenging to show that. But um, one of the things people have showed is that there's often um, physical attachment or a real close physical proximity between species so that they're actually um, sometimes even um, tubules connecting different organisms and that the products actually flow not into the external environment like we would normally think. You know, one species just dumps it out the membrane and it's floating around and another species takes it up. But there's some evidence that there's a lot of really close physical interaction with binding of different species together or different individuals of the same species for exchange of, of nutrients. And this is fairly new work. And this really changes the picture because if you start to think of individuals being bound together by tubules, exchanging nutrients, not through diffusion, excretion, and uptake, but through these tubules, you get a very different picture of what cross-feeding might be like. So this is, um, again, those are all different aspects, and I, I raised them just to show what an interesting and active field this is, and how many open questions there are, and how new many of the observations are. So you'll see the micro the tubule connection stuff is a talk I heard about a year and a half ago that was brand new work. Is that widespread? 
or is that just something that happened in one person's laboratory under particular conditions? You know, I, I think it was a little more than that, but sometimes you don't know at first because you get reports like this and then you don't know because you can get weird things happening with particular species under particular conditions. It turns out that it's weird. It doesn't really happen. Or it turns out that this is a universal feature that for a hundred years of close study, no one ever noticed before because the technology for imaging wasn't there. And now we have this new imaging technology. And all of a sudden we have just a totally different view of something as profound as exchange of nutrients. Um, so trying to give you a picture of the things that are going on. I can't answer your question because this is really an active area. And uh, it's, I think it's one of the exciting areas of research, especially given the huge interest in microbiome type things for um, health reasons and, and for practical reasons. That means that there's a lot of study of these issues, um, which brings out a lot of new observations for basic research as well. You tend to see that when you get breakthroughs in technology and, and interest from biomedical community, then you often get a new wave of, of observations um, with regard to basic questions. You get a real synergy between different subjects, which is not intentional, but you often see it. But, and I bring this up because as a researcher, one of the reasons why I called the course Puzzles in Modern Biology is that as a researcher, you want to be, you want to be very sensitive to these things because there's nothing better for your own research, if, if you're, even if you're working on a very basic question, than if there's a breakthrough in technology or there's a breakthrough in or interest in biomedical studies that has come up that isn't really directly related to what you do, but you'll find a huge amount of information will suddenly become available and the people who are nimble at exploiting that information in basic research can often really do, um, really jump ahead in their careers um, and you, you'll see that. So it really pays to kind of keep an eye on fields that are not really just your own field because often the, the things that will really push you forward will be things like that. So a good question, maybe even more than you had anticipated, but it's the connections that we're really after here. And I think that question and that topic is one of the topics that shows a lot of connections between different subjects going on right now. To add to that, um, I've been working on the cross-feeding um, in regards to the microbiome. Mm -hmm. And so we've started looking at um, some of these overflow metabolism products, and we're looking at uh, succinate as a potential metabolite that's being used to feed. Mm -hmm. um, and we're also going to be looking soon to see if these bacteria might be co-localizing with each other in the crypts of the intestines um, mm -hmm. as an option for where they might be clustering together. Uh-huh. It's interesting. So uh, I suppose a lot of people in cancer research are also would be interested in that because the CRIPS are really a site for primary site for colon cancer and colon cancer is one of the, of course, one of the major um, cancers in human populations. Plus there's been a lot of a history of a lot of great basic research on the CRIPS and uh, CRIPS are very interesting. You get a lot of tissue flow, they're very dynamic. So that would be, that's, that brings together a lot of different things. That's very interesting. So with regard to succinate, is that that some, one of the species is, is releasing succinate and, and the other one takes it up or not quite yeah. clear yet? So we're still in a pretty early phase of these experiments, but we found, um, so when I compared essentially sterile media to spent media from one of my bacterial species, you see a huge increase in succinate. And so something I'll actually be doing this week is growing um, what we, what I'm calling like its partner in yeah. that media to see if we see that depletion of the succinate. Um, and then we can do some more, like once I have that, like in a broad sense, we can go in for more specifics and like demonstrate that the growth advantage we see in the secondary species is coming from that succinate provided by that first species. Okay, so I'm not a great biochemist and maybe this is too technical, but I'm just curious. Succinate is a step in the TCA Krebs cycle. And if a species is overflowing succinate, it means that it's probably there's some sort of product inhibition through the TCA cycle 
which um, is often associated with maybe a lack of oxygen because the um, oxygen is necessary in order for the electron transport chain to flow. And the electron transport chain tends to dissipate the NADH, NAD plus disequilibrium. So what happens if there's a lack of oxygen is that you don't dissipate the NADH, NAD plus disequilibrium. And it means then that you get a strong disequilibrium of those critical molecules. And that tends to cause the Krebs cycle, TCA cycle to back up. And then you'll get some product inhibition somewhere in the TCA cycle. So that's a long way of saying, I'm wondering if, if, if you're down in an anaerobic niche in the Crips, for example, yeah. and, you, and you can't flow through your electron transport, um, oxidative phosphorylation is not flowing. I wonder if you get a NADH, NAD plus disequilibrium, which requires a, a dissipation somehow. You're getting a product mm -hmm. inhibition, just like I was answering Jonathan's question about external product inhibition, but you get it within the, so the succinate overflow in that case would represent a, a, a sort of internal attempt to relieve that inhibition and dissipate it. Um, so that makes a specific prediction about where you might see succinate overflow where you, as opposed to where you might not with regard to oxygen tension. Yeah, yeah. This, sorry, these are um, obligate anaerobes. So, in, and the one I'm actually looking at isn't even capable of running through the TCA. It only right. does the first, uh, it only runs through glycolysis over and over again. So, um, we were kind of not expecting succinate to be yeah. the one of this. The other thing that's worth mentioning is we we have measured um, lactate formate and butyrate. Um, but we're still working on the mass spec assay for acetate, and we think that yeah. might be also a big hit. Okay. I won't go on about this, but I'm, I'm personally fascinated by this, so I'm <laughs> asking lots of questions. Um, so maybe, although it's an obligate anaerobe, maybe it retains a few of the steps of the TCA cycle, and maybe it's picking up some, some NADH that it's using to drive other other um, reactions, because NADH is used to drive other things besides electron transport. Anyway, I won't go on about it anymore, but that uh, sounds like a great system and really a good example of some of the interesting things about metabolism that people are picking up these days. So thanks for that, that's great. Others? Okay. Well, then we're, we'll leave metabolism. And so today we'll talk about cytoplasmic male sterility, and I'll tell you what that means in a minute, and we'll get into that. And for today, Sohoyan, um, Jonathan Rodriguez, and Jessica, um, if, if you want to say anything now, fine. If you just want to wait and see how it goes and see if something comes up, that's fine too. But I just want to give you a chance um, in case you had something to say before I start. Yeah. Um, I just want to kind of put it out there. I have three like questions um, that I'm really curious about. One is pretty specific and then they get more abstract from there. Um, I think I'll probably, maybe the only specific one that would be relevant to bring up before we get to anything else um, would be that I've heard that um, it's been found um, that it's possible to have parental mitochondrial transmission in humans. There was a paper that came out a couple years ago, and it seems like it's very, um, very, very rare, and it's a bad thing because the families that were studied for this um, were referred because they had a mitochondrial sort of disease. So I'm wondering, um, first of all, I guess, like if that's still some, I don't know enough about the field to know if that's still something that is being looked at um, or if that's like become a puzzle in itself. And then secondly, if there's anything relevant from that that we can take into this puzzle. I mean, it seems like it's a really um, bad sort of thing that happens and um, it's rare. So it's not, you know, so maybe it's, it, and it's so uncommon that maybe it just isn't relevant, but I was just wondering if there's anything um, that might be important about that. 
Yeah, I, I don't know, you know, the very latest. I know about as much as what you said. And um, we're jumping ahead for most people, but we'll jump ahead a little bit. And then maybe this will become clear later, but I'll just say a few things about it. Um, what we'll talk about today is strongly based on on the fact that mitochondria are typically inherited, are almost always inherited in most species, although not all species, but in most species from mother to daughter. And in plants, the equivalent means that the mitochondria are transmitted through the ovules and the seeds, but not, not transmitted through pollen, so the female line. And when we call something cytoplasmic, that's really a historical artifact of the history of genetics. Because historically in genetics, many years ago, people would see that a trait was inherited through the female line, but they wouldn't know where those genes came from. And so they just assumed that the genes were in the cytoplasm somewhere because they knew that the cytoplasm was transmitted generally through the female line, that sperm don't transmit much cytoplasm and pollen don't transmit cytoplasm. So traditionally matrilineal inheritance was called cytoplasmic inheritance. So when we call cytoplasmic male sterility, we, that's really matrilineally inherited male sterility. And as people have gotten more refined genetic technology, they've seen that even in species that supposedly have matrilineal inheritance, once in a while you get a mitochondrial gene transmitted through the male line. And as Jessica said, it's very rare. And so there's a little bit of leakage is the way we would usually say. And whether that has consequences depends on the question you're asking. If you're, if you're looking at, some people use mitochondria for tracing evolutionary history with the idea that because it's purely matrilineally transmitted, then you're really looking at, at really where females went. If you're tracing, say, migrations, and you can assume that, that this does not trace male history, whereas the Y chromosome would be a pure male history um, lineage tracker. Now, if there's some leakage, even if it's very small, that can mess up inferences about history. Because if you're making an assumption that it's pure female transmission, and yet some genes get in from males into the female line, then you're not really only tracking that female line. And even though the transmission might be very rare, the female that the mitochondrion that inherited that from the, from the paternal line might then increase in frequency for other reasons. It might actually end up being a significant share of the mitochondria later on in history. So leakage is very important for tracing history. For the kinds of things we're talking about, where we're really talking about the fact that the genes typically transmit through the female line, whether it's 100% or 99%, doesn't really matter because what we're talking about is that in terms of genetic transmission and fitness, almost all mitochondrial fitness depends on making daughters and not sons or making seeds and not pollen. And whether that's, again, whether that's 100% or 99.98% is really irrelevant. So it's a question dependent thing. And I, I answer that in detail, not because maybe it's so important for us, but I often get that question when I talk about matrilineal inheritance as if, you know, how scientists are like, I've got you now, you know, it turns out that there's leakage. And so everything you said today is wrong. And believe me, I get those questions. <laughs> and um, well, it turns out everything I said with regard to fitness is right. And I wasn't talking about history. And so that's why it's important to distinguish the question with regard to the importance of those things. It can also be important for disease. And so, you know, that's another issue as well. So I read that, um, what is it? The sperm themselves, they don't have, or it's like they don't have mitochondria because after fertilization, the egg will ubiquitinate the sperm's mitochondria and destroy them. Um, is, the only, is that like the only way that um, paternal mitochondria can be passed on is if the egg doesn't recognize it? And ubiquitinated, you uh, ubiquitinated. 
Um, that sounds plausible to me. I don't know the mechanistic details, but of course we're talking about um, plants, you know, which the same thing would be true for pollen. Um, but actually, um, sperm have a lot of mitochondria. In fact, sperm are, um, they're sort of like a package of mitochondria and DNA mm -hmm. because they, um, the aerobic demands on sperm are extremely high and sperm swimming performance, the tissue that's most sensitive to mitochondrial performance in animals is sperm by far mm -hmm. because um, sperm swimming performance is very much dependent on aerobic capacity much more so than any other tissue in a human body. And so, so there's just some interest. So the mitochondria, we're not going to talk about that necessarily today unless there's time. That is one of the topics um, in the three male sterility topics that I are in one of the papers that I suggested you look at. But I was, I just picked for today one of them. Um, but the question of the role of, of mitochondria and, and sperm and maybe also in pollen, I don't know so much about pollen, um, is potentially a really interesting question. It's turned into an active area of research. Thanks. Okay, others? All right, then we'll move on to cytoplasmic male sterility. And as I said, um, cytoplasm, the word cytoplasmic is historical and it means, traditionally it means matrilineal inheritance. And so this is the inheritance of a male sterile trait through the female line. And so let's just start with the observations. The observations are that most flowering plants are hermaphroditic. And that means that if you look in a flower, it has what we call both male and female parts. And that would be the pollen and the stamens being the male part that's analogous to sperm. And then the flowers also have a, an ovary where eggs are present and a pistil, which is where the pollen gets deposited and grows pistil. The pollen grows down the pistil into the, and the style into the ovaries where it fertilizes the eggs. and as I said, most flowering plants are hermaphroditic and have both the male and female parts within a single flower. But actually there are many different kinds of um, flower morphologies with regard to the sexual parts. Some species have male and female flowers, but, the, but some of the flowers are male and some of the flowers are female. It's called diece. And then there are some plants, and there are other forms. And, and, and the best book on the subject was written by Darwin called The Different Forms of Flowers on Plants of the Same Species, which was an incredible book, really. And Darwin also noted that some species have what's called, um, in plants, there's always lots of technical terms, what's called gynodiece, which is a mixture of female plants and hermaphrodites, or what we're going to call them male sterile. So female and male sterile today means the same thing because these are normally hermaphroditic flowers where the pollen is aborted and you often see, you actually often see the male reproductive structures, the anthers are present, but they're developmentally abnormal. So you're seeing an abortion, an abortion of the pollen in some form. And so they're male sterile, or we can say the flowers are female on the plants. So you, we use both terms, female and male sterile interchangeably. So the population is then a mixture of plants that are male sterile and hermaphroditic, and that's called gynodiece. And as I said, Darwin actually studied a number of gynodiaceous species, and he was quite curious about them. And so that, that's the observation, and it's a bit puzzling because you see the failure of the production of pollen. You see, you, you see the structures often that pollen, that would hold the pollen, but then the pollen's not produced. And so whenever you see something that's aborted or not developing, some sort of failure of development, to me, that's always a clue that there's something interesting going on. Here, a plant is actually giving up its male fertility, right? And you know, if we if you buy into natural selection as the driving force behind um, design and nature, 
then whenever you see an organism giving up its reproductive capacity, you should think, wow, something's going on here and I should understand this because this is interesting. There's some strong force at play here. Um, did you want to ask a question, Jessica? Go ahead. Yeah, sorry. It's really just a clarificatory question. Yeah, sure. And that's um, so when the when the pollen isn't released, then is it that it's giving up its male fertility in terms of that same cell fertilization? Um, like, does the pollen when it when we say the pollen is aborted, is there pollen that goes somewhere else or it's just like not produced? The pollen's not produced. OK, OK. So it's yeah. not like it's that anything else could benefit from it. Not. Yeah, I mean, there's also there's there's um, failed fertilizations. Okay. So you can be fertilized and then and then abort the fertilization, so to speak. We're talking about the failure of pollen development. Either okay. the male structures are present, but the pollen's not fertile, or the male structures are are vestigial. They're sort of present, but they're clearly abnormal. Or sometimes the male structures are completely absent. Okay. But in this case, we're talking about the failure to produce pollen. Okay. Thank you. Viable pollen, anyway. Um, and this phenomenon typically happens in individuals, right? Not in like a large species scale. No, the frequency, this is one of the puzzles, and we'll talk about this. The frequency of the number, so the frequency of male sterile plants varies from, you know, rare, you see it once in a while in an individual, to as high as 50 or 60 or 70 percent of the population can have these male sterile plants. And as we'll talk about, one of the interesting things is that female frequency varies a lot even within a species. So you might see a species where most of the populations, so if you went to one location and you looked, there might be a few female plants, male sterile plants, but you might go to another location and there might be 50%. And so that's a that's one of the puzzles is actually the variation and the frequency within a species and between species, but we're not talking about, um, but we're talking about a characteristic which can be quite frequent in some populations. Now, we'll talk a bit more about how often do you see this? Is this just a rare thing that you know? As I like to say in biology, almost everything happens somewhere, right? So just because something happens doesn't immediately make it interesting. But in this case, it actually um, happens not commonly, but not rarely either. And Does so this affect the survivability of certain species then? Do certain species just die out because there's not enough um, male gametes for them to reproduce? Um, well, that's possible, but then we don't see them. So the species we do see are the species where that doesn't happen. Yeah. And so you get something intermediate where the pollen can pollen may or may not be limiting. It may or may not affect fertility overall, but it's not so severe that you're seeing a population decline towards extinction. But again, we don't know how often extinction happens because the extinctions we don't we don't see those. We In only fact, see the ones that haven't gone extinct. Right. <laughs> All right, thank you. Yeah. yeah. I have a question as well. Um, do you see this if you grow the plant alone? Like I know that plants can like speak to each other. Uh -huh. um, so is it only when they're in a pot, like their own population that you can see this happening? Um, these are genetically determined. I mean, there's always an environmental factor, but these are strongly genetically determined and you'll get them however you grow them. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the genetics, but you're, but you're, but it's true that in some plants, that the expression of sexual characters is condition dependent. So if you fertilize them a lot, they'll flower as female. If they're not fertilized very much, they'll flower as male. So you get um, sex change, so to speak, in plants. And there are, there are a number of species of plants that do that. So um, plant mating systems are very diverse and rich. Here we're talking about genetic character in this particular case. Okay, so anyway, that's the basic observation. And to emphasize a few themes, I always like to say, I like to, I've repeated this phrase many times, I like to say that failure reveals design. 
And so as I've emphasized, when you see male sterility, some kind of, or, or in general, some sort of failure like cancer, um, that's widespread, you always need to tune in because it's telling you something's going on here. And if I don't understand that, I'm going to be missing some big part of the biology of this organism. And so um, a great clue for an interesting puzzle is a failure of that sort. Now, let's just talk a little bit about why we see this, and then we'll connect up a whole bunch of different things. Why do we see this, cyto this cytoplasmic male sterility? This So sometimes the male sterility is inherited in a purely nuclear fashion. That is to say, there's no cytoplasmic component. But most of the cases of mixtures of male sterile and, and hermaphroditic plants turn out to be mitochondrial. So in this case, the cytoplasmic component is mitochondrial, meaning that the genes that cause male sterility are in the mitochondrial genome. Okay. And so then the first question is, why would mitochondria cause male sterility? And the answer to that is straightforward once you kind of tune in. And that is that mitochondria are not transmitted through pollen. And so if by preventing pollen from being produced, the plant produces even a few more seeds, just 1% or 2% more seeds, that's 1% or 2% more mitochondria that get transmitted to the next generation. And in biology, a fitness effect of 1% or 2% is a big fitness effect that will cause genes to spread very rapidly um, through populations. And it turns out that the male sterile plants usually do produce more seeds. Now, when I first learned about and Darwin actually had data on this. When I first learned about that, I thought, well, you know, how much energy does it take to make pollen? You know, because sometimes you'll see 50% more seeds, 70% more seeds produced by a male sterile plant. Is the plant really saving that much energy? And apparently the answer is yes, because um, although the the increase in seed production is variable. It's, it's not uncommon. Now, there's potentially other explanations, but it does seem to be that there's some reallocation of resources to the, to the um, production of seeds in these male sterile plants. And so the logic's pretty clear. Uh, mitochondrion that can cause abortion of pollen and then live in a plant that produces more seeds, gains a fitness advantage, and spreads through the population relatively quickly. So that's the logic. Then we also see nuclear restorer genes. These are genes that are nuclear. They're inherited biparentally, which means they're transmitted through both the seeds and through pollen grains, both through both ovules and pollen. And the nuclear restorer genes function such that if a plant has a genome that has a male sterile mitochondrion, but it has the nuclear restorer genes, the plant appears as a, hermaph a normal hermaphrodite. Sometimes the restoration is partial, but often the restoration is complete. So that if you look at a plant and it's a normal hermaphroditic plant, it might very well have a male sterile mitochondrion, but it also will have the nuclear restorer genes. And so hermaphrodites can actually be restored male sterile plants. And we'll talk about that. That's an interesting way to look at it and potentially um, quite widespread. Then the question is, well, why did, the, why did nuclear genes restore male fertility? Again, and the answer is that the nuclear genes are transmitted through the pollen. And so any loss in pollen productivity that's not completely compensated by an increase in seed productivity is a loss in the fitness of the nuclear genes. So if a plant makes 50% more seeds, that mitochondrion has a tremendous fitness gain, but the nuclear genes have lost 50% of their fitness through because they, it, when pollen is produced, let's say they would typically be the father of 10 plant, 10 um, other plants that they contribute to as a pollen donor. Now, instead of having 10 plants that they're pollen donor to, they have a 50% increase in seeds that's compensated for some of the pollen loss, but not all of it. So the cytoplasm, the mitochondrion gains a lot, but the nuclear genes lose a lot. So there's extremely strong selective pressure on the nuclear genes 
to restore pollen fertility. So we have a conflict of interest between different subsets of the genome over the allocation of resources to pollen and ovules. And so that's the, the logic of the, of the whole system. And uh, so I'll pause there because everything depends on that logic. Hey, Steve, do you know if there's uh, only one um, sort of pair of these, uh, what is it, like the mitochondrial um, leucine male sterility and then the, um, what's it, the restorer genes? Is there only one pair between those or do they sort of build up and build up like an arms race? Is there like turnover between these? It's the second, and that's a big part of what we'll talk about. It's an arms race. It's really like a host parasite system, right? And so you expect escape. If, if, if there's restorers that restore fertility, then you'd expect a new mitochondrion to come up with some other way of causing male sterility, and then you'd expect restorer genes, and that's actually what we see. And that's one of the reasons why it's such an interesting topic. So that's a, that's a great question. So um, if they build up like four or five sort of um, combinations where there's redundancy, is there like turnover to other lose other ones? Yep. Cool. Yep, that's, that's actually, um, just like in host parasite, um, or any sort of conflict situation, the dynamics of conflict tend to be um, very repeatable. You tend to get a lot of escape, you get polymorphism, you get turnover, you get an arms race, you get a whole bunch of characteristic things. We see those characteristics in this situation. And um, again, that's some of what we'll talk about today, but you know, maybe we won't have time, so it's good to, to point those things out. Do you know if anyone's tried to like remove these mechanisms in crops to where there's no conflict? And if there's like, if any of these sort of combinations have evolved pleiotropy to where if you take them out, there's like detriments to fitness? Well, it's hard in this case to remove the conflict because the mitochondria are going to be transmitted through ovules to engineer biparental transmission of mitochondria. I don't know that anybody's pulled that off. That's what yeah. you'd have to do. And then it would be a very artificial construct. Um, there's other situations so if you can mitigate the conflict then you get so it's, it's a good question the question about mitigation of conflict and its consequences we probably won't get to it but that's one of the final points i wanted to raise about analogous systems like meiotic drive um, where you get conflict between chromosomes over transmission that if the you know mitigation of the conflict is actually a fundamental issue that's very interesting so again, those are all really good questions yeah, about the basic logic here. Thanks. Can I ask a quiz question about the like the evolutionary dynamics of that yeah. system? So if I'm getting this right, if I uh, pollinate one of these um, obligate females, I will make more obligate females. Is that always the case? Um, no, because your okay. genome might contain restorers. So if you're a pollen donor mm -hmm. and your pollen has the restorers, the babies will all have the mother's cytoplasm, but they'll also have your restorer genes and potentially your restorer genes in the pollen can restore fertility, pollen fertility. I guess that was actually my question because I was thinking without the restorers, it just seems like at the beginning, uh, you would make more of these obligate females and eventually they would take over and you would go extinct. <laughs> yeah, that was Rhea's question, I think. Oh, that was, okay. Yeah, that um, if you have, if you're not making pollen, then you, you know, do they just go extinct? And the answer is, well, th that may happen, but then we don't see those species. We only see the species where that didn't happen. <laughs> so we don't know how often extinction, but, but actually it's a little bit more complicated. Than that. If you follow the dynamics, as pollen becomes more limiting, the advantage to being male sterile declines. So there's a frequency dependence, which will potentially protect you from extinction, right? Because because male sterile plants still need to be fertilized. Oh, that's so, true. They can self-fertilize. So if, if the male sterile plants are in high frequency, then the plants producing pollen, if, if they can self-fertilize or they fertilize individuals in a neighborhood and there's spatial variation, then you get a rescue. So we're not really something we're not really going into, but all of the fitness components are frequency dependent, as is always the case in a, anything having to do with sex ratios or sex allocation. 
So the dynamics are strongly influenced by the frequency dependence as well. So that's overlaid on top of the conflict, is you've got conflict with frequency dependence. But that's not uncommon for, for conflict situations. Conflict situations often have frequency dependence. And so you often get um, complex dynamics or population dynamics are a characteristic of conflict situations. So that's one reason why this is a great puzzle, all those questions, because it actually captures a lot of aspects of conflict, polymorphism, dynamics, frequency dependence. But it also captures a lot about genome evolution and things like that. So I think one of the great challenges when we think about organisms and how they're put together, I like to use the word design, um, natural design as opposed to so-called intelligent design, natural. Do we think about how organisms are designed naturally? We tend, all of us, to think of, of some, in some sense, like an engineer, right? How does the organism put together to function, to accomplish a task, to feed, to extract resources, to break down food? And these are all engineering questions in the sense of how does an individual achieve a particular manipulative function of the environment? And, and so we tend naturally to think about those like an engineer, and that's often a good way to think. I'm happy with that. But one of the interesting things about biology is we have to be very careful because our human notions of engineering design and biological notions of engineering design, sometimes they overlap very nicely and you can use engineering principles, and sometimes they don't. And here's a good example of where they don't, right? Because we tend to think of engineering principles in terms of success of individuals. And we tend to take the individual as the unit of design. And here we're seeing that actually that's not the case, that there's conflict within the individual. And so this is a very rich subject because it has all of the complexity of arms races and post-parasite situations, conflict, polymorphism, frequency dependence. And it's got all of the complexity of, of, well, what is an individual? Within an individual, we're getting this conflict. And so our notions of organismal design as being you know, unitary and individuals as being how we think of everything is actually not being the case. And then we, you know, then we always have to ask the question, is this just weird? Because it, again, as I've said many times, Biology is full of weird things that happen occasionally. And you can't be too distracted by those, otherwise you'll just, you know, you'll never get anywhere. On the other hand, there's some things that are weird about biology that are not just minor issues. And this issue of conflict between different parts of the genome is potentially not a minor issue. Remember early, the very first class session, or maybe the second one, I talked about the regulation of growth and how the regulation of growth is the opposition between imprinted genes where genes expressed by the, from, from the mother tend to um, push for slower growth in the babies and genes that are inherited from the father tend to push for faster growth. And so the regulation of growth, perhaps the most important trait of a developing mammal is by this conflict that's, that's really a conflict between mother and father in a multiple mating species, potentially, that's the interpretation. Um, and so when you think about gene regulation, which is a classic engineering problem in systems biology, systems biology is often taught with engineering principles. And I, I, I'm happy with that. I'm not arguing against that. But you have to be careful because engineering, human engineering design and biological design are not the same. And you have to be very sensitive to that. So this is a, to me, this is a great puzzle because it just has so many of those things going on simultaneously. And then in addition, it really asks the question of, well, okay, that conflict's going on. What does it mean for cooperation between the mitochondrion and the nuclear genes, which is fundamental to a functioning cell because the nucleus is, I mean, the mitochondrion's the site of many crucial cellular functions, respiration, of course, but many other things as well, programmed cell death, um, apoptosis, for example, is often mitochondrially based. Um, Jessica. Thanks. I have a question about kind of this whole design um, idea. And the question is really like, okay, so are we looking in these puzzles, are we looking for then like 
it seems like there's a difference between saying I'm puzzled because this doesn't this process doesn't seem optimal versus I'm puzzled because like there I mean because there could be different equilibria that like aren't optimal and they just they work and they might not be the way that we are thinking that they should work um but I'm wondering like here for example you know we have like this male sterility like the plants still exist they're still going forward um and it's puzzling to us but are we looking for optimization there or are we just trying to explain like how these equilibria are stable so i mean the key the key notion in all of science is surprise right and so your question is what well, what do you mean by surprise is that <laughs> and, and why should we be surprised in this case and i think the issue is that the Darwinian lesson was that we expect organisms to be designed to maximize their own individual success. So when we don't see that, we should be surprised. And maximizing individual success seems inconsistent with knocking out half of your reproductive function because we equate success with reproductive function, right? So that's why male sterility or female sterility for various reasons, male sterility is is not uncommon in nature. Female sterility is is not so common, which is itself a puzzle. Um, but that's why it's surprising. So, so you, everything you said is true, but but in some sense, you don't you don't really need to think about optimization. Although that's kind of what I'm talking about. We expect organisms to be moving in the direction of optimizing individual fitness. We don't expect them to optimize individual fitness, but when we see something that's a severe departure from that, we're surprised. For surprise, then we think this is a candidate puzzle. Good time for a break. We'll come back at 11.02 and we'll Continue on. Those are great questions. Oh, thanks. <laughs> 